Hello, and welcome back to the Here Together podcast from the Philadelphia Orchestra. I'm your host, Tori Marcioni, and this is a space to hear from the artists and activists working to create a more equitable future inside and outside the concert hall. The music you heard in the intro was part of the childhood soundtrack of our guest today, pianist Laura Downs. The song, I Cover the Waterfront, appears on Laura's 2015 album, Honoring Billie Holiday, dedicated to her own father, who nurtured her early love of music with regular living room listening sessions of his vast vinyl collection. Throughout her career, Laura has brought her exquisite talent to a wide range of repertoire, particularly American works, even when doing so was seen as risky by the Eurocentric establishment. But the risks paid off both commercially and critically, and she's now known as one of the foremost players of her generation. But she didn't stop there. Laura is out to change the consciousness around concert music as well as the content. On her NPR podcast, Amplify, she interviews visionary Black musicians who are shaping the present and future. Through her free workshop series, The My Promise Project, Laura uses freedom and protest songs to inspire students to create their own artistic statements of leadership and activism. And this past February, she launched Rising Sun, a hub for new recordings of works by Black composers. All that to say, Laura Downs is a woman on a mission and a multi-hyphenate to the extreme. I know that if I had stuck to the original plan and I was, you know traveling around and playing nice, polite recitals in nice, polite dresses, I would feel miserable and trapped. Laura Downs has been playing the piano since age four. Her parents, an Ohio-born lawyer of Eastern European Jewish extraction and a biochemist from Harlem by way of Jamaica, weren't themselves musically gifted, but they encouraged Laura and her two sisters to indulge their creativity. The couple, who had met in activist circles in 1960s San Francisco, homeschooled their daughters and nurtured their curiosity. But it wasn't a utopian upbringing. When Laura was five, her dad got sick. He battled for four years, then passed when Laura was nine. And after that, Mrs. Downs, understandably, wanted a change of scenery. So she packed up her three daughters, two pianists and a cellist, and moved to Paris. The girls traveled Europe, performing as a trio, and studying in various conservatories. Music itself was home. I think we stuck with music. We kind of clung to music because of the chaos in in life, you know. I think that when I look back, when my dad got sick and, you know, everything was just very sad and very uprooted. I mean, what better thing as a kid than to have this thing that you do for several hours every day that you actually love and it's your safe place and you can just shut out everything else and be in it. So who knows, you know, if things had been better at home, maybe we would have just like given it up at 12 like everyone else. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. Was there any like child star component of it? Was performing about you guys loving it and that's what you do when you love it? Or was it, this is helping us pay the bills and there's pressure on you to do it? (laughs) Okay, so I think my mom was just a really bad stage mother, honestly. Like, she didn't didn't push us in that sense. Um, One thing my mom did that I think was smart was that, like, if we did babysitting or, you know, we had like a little concert or something, or we got money from a competition that went back into the lessons. So it was like, this is something important and valuable. And we all want it to happen. I think that was great. It was pretty healthy. It wasn't like any of the, you know, we weren't really pushed. I think any stress was self-imposed. It can be a very stressful environment, especially when you get to that stage where you're constantly doing the competitions and yeah, the the competition, the level of competition within the conservatory system is pretty toxic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's funny. I feel like there are parents who have to really push their kids, and then there are the parents who maybe have to hold their kids back a little bit. <laughs> mm-hmm. I remember every time something didn't work out, you know, if I didn't win a competition, my mom would always ask me, you know, do you love doing this? Like, I can see that you're very sad today. But do you love doing this? And the answer was always yes. And I think to her credit, if I had said no, we would have like, that would have been that. That's so important. Because and that like, 
native joy to it is still so clear in your your playing and your practice as a musician today. I think that's so awesome. <laughs> Way to go, mom. <laughs> um, and okay, take me back to when you're living in Europe and and sort of how you felt perceived in Europe and then consequently how you how you felt differently perceived coming back to America. Yeah, yeah. So it was it was complicated and it was almost self-contradictory because in Europe I felt for the first time at home like in classical music, right? The first that was the first time that there was an environment that was welcoming that was normalized where it was a normal thing to do and I wasn't a total weirdo for doing it. But at the same time, right, all these other things came into play. So I was very much othered um, in so many other ways. Um, I think I was still a very good little girl when I was doing my studies in Europe. And I wasn't actively questioning anything. But the seeds of questioning were definitely, you know, starting to take root. And as you can imagine, that was as traditional of a system of an attitude as one could find. I mean, this is long enough ago that my t teachers were of a generation that's gone now that was probably, what, like three generations removed from, you know, composers I was studying. So the typical answer to why, why anything was because, like, either because I said so, or because that's how we do it, or, you know, there was just no inquiry. There was no spirit of inquiry. And I'm a very curious person. <laughs> yeah, I'm so curious about that, because weren't you homeschooled before you went into these conservatory settings? Weren't your parents all about, like, challenge the man? So how did, how'd you end up such a good little girl? Well, maybe because that was the first time that I was in sort of a structured, rigid environment. So I think I felt like, I guess this is how things are now, you know, and yeah, it was a departure. Although I will say that even the homeschooling, the experience of learning music was different than the learning of everything else. The learning of everything else was so self-guided and somewhat haphazard. And so I was learning, you know, what I wanted to know by just picking a book off the shelf. Whereas, of course, in classical music from the very beginning, there are rules and structures so I don't know how my brain just, it kind of straddled those two places. But I think in Europe, I just, maybe I realized that that was the limitation of this art form that I love, that no one seemed to have very good answers for me about why we do things or how, or, you know, with what intention it was just, well, this is the tradition. This is how it's always been. Now it's your turn. Keep going. That's a really interesting point. How did your Americanness feel to you in those years? Like when you say they, they saw you as the American, what did that mean? What connotations did that have? And how did that affect how you saw yourself and your nation? When I look back, it was almost like a, I mean, my sisters and I it was almost like a circus act. It was like the three American down sisters. And I remember really clearly that the place where it felt Ooh, very disrespected to be an American was exactly in the music. You know, there was always in every audition, competition, putting together sort of recital programs, there was usually a requirement for something that was a 20th century piece. That was supposed to be modern 20th century. So um, I always had this impulse to play something American. And I would ask my teachers and A, they didn't know the repertoire and B, they would, you know, just sort of laugh off things like Gershwin or Copeland as being very commercial and not serious and not um, highbrow. So I don't know, you know, at, at the same time in Europe, I think still, maybe less now, there was of course this glamour to being American, right? Thank you. 
That was On Gossamer Wings by Benny Golsom from Laura Downs' second album, American Ballads, which was ranked by Amazon.com among the four best recordings of American music ever made. Remember when I said her chutzpah paid off? I've heard from some of my Black friends who have traveled abroad that there is a sense of relief um, to just be categorized as American, that some of the other baggage that is experienced here kind of slips off did you did you feel that it sounds like you might have experienced that in reverse because you were younger when you left yeah and I mean I think that's what made the next chapter so intense for me I mean you see me I'm hard to pinpoint anyway and um so then you know when I came back here and I realized that it was way more complicated (laughs) it was a shock when, or I know you came back when you were 21, but why did you decide to make the move without your family to, to come back? I'd been, yeah, at home with my mom and sisters my whole life. And I don't know, it's, it's hard to look back and understand what drove you. But I just had this feeling, you know, that I had to get out. And then there was a boy and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, fair enough. That's as good a reason as any when you're 21 to do anything. Um, So once you were back in America, it sounds like there was a a discovery of identity that was partially internal and partially through what was being mirrored to you by others. Is that that accurate? Mm -hmm. Totally. So where I moved back to was Berkeley, California. And two things happened. I mean, for one thing, when I left, I was a girl still. And I came back and I was a young woman. And so I was, you know, walking around by myself on the streets of Berkeley and Oakland and sort of experiencing the response to that and who was responding and how. And that immediately clarified some things. And then in Berkeley, I was with this group of like, um, you know, intellectual young people who, who felt really free to talk about race with me, but from a place of whiteness. So there were these unending conversations about ethnicity and like what my role was as a biracial person, but I wasn't there yet. And I realized that I'd been so protected from it, you know, first by the bubble of my family and then by the bubble of being in Europe and by the bubble, honestly, of just being immersed in this you know, weird 19th century world. So I think it was just trying to understand how it was that the world could see me in so many different ways. I really, I felt alone. I felt unprepared and I felt like I had to figure something out. And um, yeah, so to find out for myself, I guess, how I could express what really at the time, I mean, it just felt like confusion. It didn't feel like anything else. It didn't actually feel like identity. It felt like confusion. But so how can I understand this confusion? How can I put some shape to this confusion is maybe by just figuring out how to express the different parts that are jumbled. Music was the way to do that. That was Laura Downs playing Some of These Days by Florence Price, a composer whose name you've heard quite a bit on this podcast already. Price is definitely having a moment and is becoming a kind of retrospective it girl of the 2020s. Laura, of course, was way ahead of the trend. I had pitched a Florence Price recording to one of the labels two years ago, and they didn't think that there was enough interest. (laughs) So I just did it myself. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, like the the mix of like I freaking told you so and I'm really glad she's getting her due. It's probably like really strong. Yeah, I mean there's a feeling though I have to say when you have been doing this work, I mean that that's been the point all along is to open up this world and bring people in. So it is incredibly gratifying. I mean 
I'm sad that it took racial violence and, you know, sort of this national reckoning um, to make this happen. I kind of wish it hadn't gone that way because now I think that this music is being imbued with the weight of a lot of stuff. Um, but if, if it opens the door, I think, fine, we just have to come to a he healthy understanding of what this music is and, and why it's here and why it belongs to us. I really want, <laughs> I really want that authenticity to be, you know, present in all of what we're doing. Um, and I have one sort of major concern, which is I, I'm seeing, I'm probably answering more than what you asked, but I think it's, it's really related. Um, I think we've gone very, very quickly from, you know, the little cannon over here to Florence Price and everything else over here. And there's a, a gap. And I, I think what the next thing I need to do is to fill in the gap and tell the story of American music. Let's talk about Rising Sun. Because it's so cool. And that launched, like, February of, of... You know, the my journey with music by Black composers started 15 years ago. Florence Price and then, you know, all the rabbit holes. And I've taken the approach of mm, connecting it with other music. You know, with integrating it into the wide tradition. And sort of opening up that tradition and saying, this is here. And this makes these other things sort of like look different. And that's been really important to me and really effective. But at the same time, as the work has gone on and the pile of what I know has gotten higher, I've realized, yes, this is part of an American tradition and it's a tradition on its own. And the story that really needs to shift for all the reasons that we're talking about is that story of exceptionalism, you know, there was a person called Florence Price and she did a thing. And there was a person called William Grant Still and he did a thing or a few things. Um, and once you see that all of these lives and all this music, they're all connected. I mean, these people knew each other and taught each other and collaborated with each other and, you know, passed on tradition. Then I started wanting to create some sort of a hub for this music. So I wrote a grant to the Sphinx organization in the fall and my original proposal was to record 20 pieces of music by Black composers that, you know, had not yet been recorded. Also, that was also um, sort of spurred along by a talk that I gave for the Public Radio Program Directors Group last year, talking about diversity in programming. And, you know, the overwhelming response was, we really want to change the sound of classical radio. We don't have the recordings to do that which is totally fair and totally true. So I was like, okay, I know someone who can do that for you. So um, I wrote this grant. I got the grant. I started, um, and then I was like going to wait until the spring. And instead I just went. So we've been releasing every month an EP of four or five tracks, pieces of music that haven't been recorded before or that have been sort of archivally, you know, recorded that need high quality, fresh recordings. And I mean, I'm not great at math, but it, it's quite exponential, right? Because four new tracks to every radio station in the country every month, that's a lot. Um, and it's been so fun. And it's been, I mean, it's been tremendously hard work. And this morning I was just like sending new tracks to my producer who is, has infinite patience. But yeah, I mean, I never would have imagined that this would be such um, an immersive experience. And yeah, the timing is interesting and weird. Um, but I'm all in. It's, it's just, I mean, there's so much music to discover so much. Yeah. And it's such, it's so powerful to see you in real time shifting the canon, like, like you say, to exponentially increase what is available is so powerful, especially in a genre that suffers from this idea of being dead, <laughs> right? That you're, you are making it as alive as could be, which I think is so cool. Yeah. 
That's that's the conflict in my head right now, is that I feel like on the one hand, this work, this effort, this focus is being perceived as some sort of like social justice activism thing. And instead, what it's doing is making this art form that we all worry about day in and day out, right? It's making it come alive. It's making it have relevance to a whole other universe of people. So I just want, I want to focus on the joyfulness of that, not the like, we have to do this because it's important. And we said we do it in hashtag, you know, it's like... (laughs) Totally. It's not like the eating your vegetables. It's actually like, this is dessert. Like we get to enjoy. Yeah. Right. No, I even have to do it in myself, you know, just because all this is happening really fast. Like I'm always on some sort of a deadline. And so I'm, you know, and there is of course messaging around it always. And then there are these moments when I just sit back and like, I literally listen to what I'm playing at the piano and I'm like, oh my God, this is just so beautiful. There's this piece by William Grant Still that I play every time you give me a chance. (laughs) It's called Summerland. And I swear to you, it's the most beautiful piece that I have played ever. It's just exquisite. And yeah, so there are just these moments kind of of like wonderment. How did we not know this. I'm curious if if music has ever felt too small for you. I'm thinking about the pandemic and like did music make you feel small or or large? Does that make sense? Yeah, no it does. Um I mean my simple answer is that music this year has made me feel huge because the doors have been flung open, right? So even though it was frustrating and strange to you know, channel your creativity through the computer screen. It also was so exciting to me that the world was the audience now that I didn't have to have assumptions about who was listening. I mean, I couldn't have assumptions about who was listening. Um, That changed the way that I felt empowered to communicate, I think. And it really encouraged me to want to hold on to that openness when we do go back and, you know, behind closed doors, like who's in that room and how do we define that? I think it's a very important time for, you know, to reimagine that reach. Mm. And that kind of leads us to the Promise Project, because it sounds like that's where you're really passing down a lot of these ideas. So tell me about how that was conceived and and how it's uh, evolved (laughs) through COVID. So um, this is a project that originated from a collaboration that I have with the poet Rita Dove, who just has her new book out. It's so magnificent. Um, But there's a poem called Testimonial, and there's a phrase in the poem that says, I gave my promise to the world and the world followed me here. And I don't know, you know, these are just like words that stick in your head. And I started working with young people, and this was right around 2016, this was right you know, in the months around the 2016 election, um, I started working with young people in this like environment of mm, doubt, fear, division, all the things. And 
encouraging this kind of self-inquiry about what is the thing? What is this little thing that I have inside that, you know, can hold me up and I can give and it can hold the world up. And I mean, I realized that it was an essential question for me because what I had when, from the time I was four years old was this talent to play the piano, right? So that's the promise or the gift that I had, but it took me a lifetime to understand how to apply that and how to make it actually valuable for myself and others. And so, you know, just putting that in the minds and hands of really young people, it's very powerful. They say to me always, you know, no one asks us who we are. They ask us like, what do we want to be when we grow up? Which is an absurd question. And the then worst. just makes you feel sort of like, right? <laughs> the worst question something. ever. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think, you know, it's really important for kids, especially in the kind of time that we're living and in the, difficult circumstances that a lot of these kids are living to find that thing, hold on to that thing, like, you know, feed and water that thing and know that because you, um, I don't know, you can have a big dream and you can do a small thing every day, you know, kids are kids, right? So they say, well, my promise is to, is to save the planet, you know, to save the environment. And I'm like, cool. So how could you do that now? Cause you don't have to wait till you grow up and you be the president <laughs> to do that. Right. Like, let's go pick up some trash in the park. Um, and it's great. And it gives, you know, empowerment and like kind of just joy in being here and alive. So yeah, that's been really, um, affirming for me. And during COVID I had, you know, big plans to do all kinds of residencies all around the country and instead of course we were on zoom and um yeah those conversations were really healing you know even what can you do right now in your mind now that you're trapped in you know your house all year what can you do in your mind that can keep you going and can be your promise to the world That was Laura Downs playing Nora's Dance by Nora Douglas Holt, a classical composer, pianist, blues singer, radio personality, magazine editor, educator, activist, socialite, jet setter, and bona fide muse of the Harlem Renaissance. Tragically, more than 200 of Nora's compositions were lost when her storage unit was robbed while she was away on an extended European tour following her fifth divorce. Nora's dance only survived because it had been published in a magazine that she'd founded, no less, called Music and Poetry. And I only know about it because of Laura. It's also interesting to me that you have been very consistent in your interest in more diverse composers. And and it feels like the sort of mainstream is starting to catch up in a sort of way, especially on the like activism tip. And I'm wondering if there's any sense of like frustration or like you guys are fake friends <laughs> I want to answer this question so carefully <laughs> um no you know it is such a fascinating time I think I'm in a very unique position because all of this action has been very swift um I think there's a whole lot of confusion at every level I think that institutions are confused about how to do it um they know they need to do it I think audiences are confused about why it's being done. I look at my colleagues and there's such a range of feeling of um, excitement, but also tokenism and also distrust and, you know, also just like tiredness, you know, like this is too much too fast. But I've, but I put myself intentionally here, You're re- you know, 15 years. Yeah, I've been doing this. So I don't. I can't even say that I feel like this huge difference in, you know, my moving in the world this year. It's, it's, it's more perceiving that, yeah, everything else is kind of like coming to the same place. It's also been really beautiful to see some of my colleagues step into the potential of, you know, 
putting your own meaning behind your work. I mean, this is what's surfaced on the NPR show, Conversations with Other Musicians, is that, yeah, this training, this industry is confining in some ways. And I think maybe the people who are the most othered feel the most pressure to, like, just get in line. That's easy to do. So this environment, this kind of pause, this kind of... mm, just examining of everything we're doing. I've, I've, I've really loved seeing my colleagues just investigate that and yeah, grow up really fast. <laughs> I mean, and that's actually interesting to me in the sense of like, um, I'm just wondering, yeah, what have you observed in sort of those interactions of like commission, how, how the commissioning of new works is framed? Mm-hmm. Well, honestly, I mean, I've come across a lot of feelings from my composer colleagues this year, because I mean, on the one hand, your phone's ringing every day, and that's great. And on the other hand, I think it the problem is this mm, putting together of big social justice issues and, and artistic expression. And I know that, you know, there are composers who would like to write music that is free of that burden. Um, for me, my piece of this, my my motivation to commission new work and to record works by living composers really doesn't have to do with the outside world, like seeing that this exists. It has to do with the next generation and, you know, just having the next, yeah, the the young kids who are coming up who want to write music or play music, just look at this whole body of work and say, oh, cool. Like I can do this. I can just jump in and be in this. And that I think will make a big difference in our world and our field and our future. Wow. What an amazing conversation with Laura Downs. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Here Together podcast. I'm Tori Marcioni, and we'll be back next month with more conversations about music, social justice, and all the life in between. In the meantime, check out some bonus content from this episode where Laura talks about performative activism and why we shouldn't refer to composers as marginalized. Please also remember to subscribe, rate, review, and recommend to your friends. Now, here's Laura Downs performing Love Will Find a Way by UB Blake for Rising Sun. (laughs) ¶¶